Welcome to this video, Chastisement, Question and Answer. I received a few good questions about chastisements after we did the video about the same subject. And the first question is about the three days of darkness. And actually there's a couple questions about the three days of darkness. One is specific to the prophecy itself. In other words, the details concerning the prophecy. And the other question is about the timeline of when it would occur. There's also another question about the Antichrist, which is a very difficult subject. And what we'll attempt to do is we'll look at the three days of darkness and the Antichrist, and we'll provide how the event of the three days of darkness and the Antichrist, of where they fit in in the events that have been prophesied. Let's begin. Nomine Patres, Ephili, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. So the first question is about the three days of darkness. And before we discuss it, the three days of darkness is obviously in a chastisement, which is conditional. And conditional in the sense that it could be avoided altogether, since it's a chastisement or it could be mitigated so that it's not intense as what some seers have prophesied. So with that caveat, I'd like to also add that it's obviously not a teaching of the church. You can't open up the catechism and go to the section on the three days of darkness. It's been provided to us via private revelation. Now that doesn't mean that because of that, it is false, or that it will not happen. But, as I mentioned, it's conditional. So it may not happen at all. So we're going to assume, for the purposes of this video, that it will happen to one degree or another. So I'm going to assume that you know a little bit about the three days of darkness. I'm not going to discuss it in length. I'm just going to touch on it to answer the specific questions. And the first is, how does it fit in with, in relation to the other events, in other words? And the three days of darkness was mentioned most notably, but not exclusively, by Marie Julie Jeheni, St. Padre Pio, and Blessed Elena Aiello. In all three of those, it was in the context of a chastisement where fire falls from the sky. Now, the fire falling from the sky prophecy is also mentioned by our Blessed Mother, specifically and very clearly at the approved apparitions of Our Lady of Akita in Japan, also in Our Lady of Good Success of the Purification in Quito, Ecuador. And it was also mentioned at Garibandal, which we know is not approved at this point, and it's not condemned as well. And it's important when you discuss these type of prophecies regarding chastisements that we understand why these prophecies exist. And it's basically to bring us back to God and to stop us from spiraling on our way into sin. And these chastisements will only occur if there's not sufficient conversion and repentance. If the warning, the miracle, and permanent sign occurs, and there's not sufficient repentance, and there's not sufficient conversion, then we're expected to see a chastisement from God. And the chastisement from God clearly stated to be fire from the sky, and also the three days of darkness, all of which appear to be not natural. In other words, they're not in natural occurrence, but they're actually a chastisement directly from God. So the other question was about the Antichrist. The difficulty is discussing the Antichrist is there's many references that seem to be incoherent. There's many descriptions of the Antichrist, and there's three major views that I can identify today. And to make it more complicated, they overlap somewhat. So the first view is that the Antichrist 
is a, a reference to a person that previously existed. And I read that it's attributed to Nero specifically. That may be the case where it is attributed to someone in the past, but as I mentioned, there's overlap between the views. It also could be attributed to someone that is yet to come. Often we see echoes in the Bible and in prophecy where we see repetition. And the other point of view on the Antichrist is one that does overlap with what we just stated. It's the view that the Antichrist is a person. Well, that is clearly stated by St. Paul in the second letter of Philosians in chapter 2, I believe it's verse 3 through 4, where he's referred to, depending upon your translation, as the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, the man of iniquity. But the idea is here that it's a person. It's not a demon, it's not a devil, it's not Satan, it's a person. And the third point of view is that it is a spirit, or the devil, in other words. So you see references to the spirit in St. John, first letter, chapter 4, and also Pope Benedict XVI, refer to the spirit of the Antichrist as getting stronger. And then there's many references in the Bible. I mentioned the one by St. Paul, the man of sin. There's references, again, in the first letter of St. John, in chapter 2, I believe, where he refers to the Antichrist as being anyone who rejects God, and that there are many Antichrists. Then that's a perspective of, it's a spirit, in other words, where a spirit of apostasy, of rejection of God, of not believing that Christ is God. And in that point of view, you could look at some of the, the major nefarious figures of our time as being any Christ, and also anyone who rejects God, anyone who claims to be an atheist as being an antichrist, and often figures such as Napoleon, Mao, Stalin, Hitler, they've all been referred to as antichrist, and Judas as well in the New Testament. Judas is referred to as the son of perdition, which is also a term that could be attributed to an antichrist. Also in the Bible, there's references to the two beasts, the beast of the sea, the beast of the land, and also the dragon. And the dragon is also referred to as being Satan. It is one of these situations that I spoke about previously in other videos where there's a certain veil that we're not allowed to see through. We don't have clarity. Even looking at the church fathers, there's disagreements along the same lines regarding what is the Antichrist. The Antichrist is only mentioned specifically by St. John. Because of that, many say that that is clearly the definition of the Antichrist. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to get back to the timeline, and then we'll talk about where the Antichrist fits in with some assumptions. We we'll have to make some assumptions. Is the Antichrist a spirit? Is the Antichrist a person? Is the Antichrist Satan? We'll make some assumptions and we'll see where it fits in these timelines. I mentioned previously that we're currently in the apostasy, the rejection of God culturally and in politics, in all aspects of society, where God is being almost outlawed in discussion or outlawed in any type of open public forum. Now, there'd be some that would argue that, oh, you're free to believe whatever you want. Yeah, but just don't talk about it, right? And don't bring it up. You can't teach it in school, at least not in Western society. And it's looked at as one of the subjects that's almost taboo in social circles. Don't mention politics and don't mention religion. So don't mention your faith. You can believe whatever you want, but don't mention your faith. And that's the kind of society that we live in today. And the results and the implications of what I just mentioned is that the, the commandments of God and his teachings, teachings of Jesus, they're not reflected in our society. You could argue that they once were, but they are being vigorously stripped from where they existed.
and actually being replaced by sinful policies and sinful ideas. So if we're in the apostasy now, the next major event would be the warning or the illumination of conscience, as some people call it. And probably more correctly, it should be referred to as a correction of conscience. And then there's the miracle mentioned at Garabandal and the permanent sign has to be left there. And the permanent sign is also, besides being a prophecy of Garabandal, it's a prophecy of Batania, which is approved. And it also is a prophecy of Medjugorje, which of course is not yet approved. And for those wondering, it's the third secret, which was, which is probably the only secret that we have clarity about from Medjugorje. So going through the timeline, the apostasy, the warning, the miracle, and the permanent sign, if we do not convert, if we do not repent, then we would have to suffer the fate of the chastisement, which was mentioned in multiple prophecies, not just by the, the seers regarding the three days of darkness, but also, as I mentioned, Our Lady of Akita, Our Lady of Good Success, mentioned very clearly the fire falling from the sky, as well as Our Lady of Garabandal. So assuming that there is this chastisement, which is conditional, like I mentioned, the fire falling from the sky could be part of the three days of darkness. So to understand the framework or how it actually fits in, you have to understand that the church is going through a road to Calvary, and that's actually mentioned in the Catechism. So it's the mystical body of Christ that's suffering the same fate that Jesus suffered back in the redemption. So what does that mean? Well, that means that we had an agony in the garden for the church, and we had a scourging, and we have the crowning of thorns, the carrying of the cross, and the crucifixion. And you'll see how this relates in a minute. So you can look at the agony of the garden as starting around the same time that Pope Leo XIII had his vision. He had a vision of Satan discussing more power, asking for more power from God, that he would destroy the church. And also he had a vision regarding future occurrences within the church. And very much like it's been described of Jesus's agony in the garden. And then the scourging. What is a scourging for the mystical body of Christ? Think of the scourging as a physical chastisement. It's World War I, it's World War II. And also the loss of life that we've seen by the communist revolution in China, where millions of people lost their lives with the, not just the civil war, but also the subsequent purging, and also the loss of life afflicted on the Ukrainians by Stalin. And next is the crowning of thorns. So the crowning of thorns, you can look at that as a chastisement of the spirit, spiritual chastisement. And that's exactly what the apostasy is. Besides the rejection of God, there's a spiritual darkness where people's intellects cannot even see the obvious before them. And they're almost unable to see and appreciate God's existence in the world. So the carrying of the cross would be the church taking the sin of the world upon itself and suffering and taking that sin on the road to Calvary. The crucifixion. Now the crucifixion is where we tie into the three days of darkness. Three days of darkness represent the three days of Jesus in the tomb. So the three days of darkness, whether it happens or not, corresponds to that. Now, if it doesn't happen, then at minimum, Jesus is pointing to the tribulation of the church, to the mystical body of Christ on the road to Calvary. And he's saying these three days of darkness is equivalent to the church being in the tomb for three days. So what comes after the three days of darkness? Well, in chapter 20 
in the book of Revelation, or the book of the Apocalypse, if you prefer. You have a reference to the defeat of the dragon, and the dragon is cast down into the abyss, and there will be a thousand years of reign of the Immaculate Heart. And it's not doesn't say the Immaculate Heart, but it's a triumph of the Immaculate Heart. It's a triumph of the reign of the divine will, and it's mentioned to be a thousand years, which means a long time. It's not necessarily strictly a thousand years. You look at that, at the reign of the divine will, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, coming after the three days of darkness and the defeat of Satan, you look at that, that's the spiritual resurrection. So you have a, a spiritual Calvary and you have a spiritual resurrection. After that, it says again in chapter 20, Satan will be let loose for a short time after the thousand year reign of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart and the reign of the divine will. Now, and I'm going to give you my opinion because it's not clear. So I haven't heard this anywhere, so I can't point to something and make a reference like I normally would. My thinking is because you have this spiritual Calvary, it's the mystical body of Christ, you have the spiritual resurrection of his church and of the members of it. And also it's going to flow over into the whole world. I believe also at this time that we're looking at a spiritual antichrist. And it coincides with what Pope Benedict XVI said, where he said that the spirit of the antichrist is becoming stronger. And there is some other backing for that in the Blue Book by Father Gobi. He mentioned that the Blessed Mother told us that the dragon, referred to in the book of the Revelation, is atheistic communism. So it sounds like a very conceptual or spiritual construct. And that would fit nicely into this idea of a spiritual antichrist. But then you could say, well, okay, so it says very clearly in Thessalonians that the antichrist is a person. That doesn't correspond to what, what's being said here. And maybe it could be both. Like you see Jesus coming in a spiritual manner. I believe Father Iannusi referred to it as an intermediate coming, which is not the final coming. So it's not Jesus coming back in the flesh, but coming spiritually. Others refer to it as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And more than likely, it's going to be the outpouring that's Trinitarian in nature. To answer the question or the concern regarding the person, we have to look exactly at what St. Paul said in Thessalonians 2. He said that before Jesus comes, he said, don't be deceived. First will be the apostasy, and then the revelation of the man of sin. So when he talks about Jesus coming, are you talking about what we're talking about now, the intermediate coming of Jesus? Or are we talking about the final coming? I would submit to you that's a reference to the final coming. And that the second coming, the second appearance of the Antichrist, which is mentioned in chapter 20 of the book of Revelation, is a physical coming of the Antichrist. And it would correspond to the second coming of Jesus and the final judgment, which I think fits nicely into the church's eschatology. When discussing chastisement, it's more important to focus on the messages surrounding chastisements that are meant for us to avert them. The messages regarding repentance and conversion, prayer, and the Eucharist. No matter what comes through the door of time, it's important for us to maintain the faith, to not waver, and to say as St. Paul did in the second letter to Timothy in chapter 4, I have fought the fight, I have run the race, and I have kept the faith. Thank you for watching, and God bless.